Okay, thanks everybody for waiting. We will now get underway with the Talking Plant Science Seminar. So, first of all, on behalf of the ARC Center of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet. Um, here, where we are coming from in Hobart, this is the Muwinana people's land. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and to global society. Okay, I'll advance. Okay, right, so there's Bruce Walsh. Um, so for introduction, um, I, I had um, a formal introduction for Bruce of about 30 pages for all of his achievements. The only good news for everybody is this is at least shorter than his books. Um, but um, first of all, I'd just like to say that it's a real honor um, for me to actually to be able to introduce one of my heroes in science and someone that's actually done a lot in the fields of quantitative genetics for, for a lot of disciplines and mentored a lot of people in, in science and actually made quantitative genetics accessible for a lot of biologists, I, I would add. And, and hopefully that will come through today. So for me, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce to you Bruce Walsh. He is a population and quantitative geneticist with very diverse interests in plant animal breeding, evolutionary biology, and statistical methods. He is currently a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology, plant sciences, and public health at the University of Arizona, but he's perhaps best known for the two graduate textbooks on quantitative genetics that he co-authored with Mike Lynch titled Genetics and Analysis of Quantitative Traits and Evolution and Selection of Quantitative Traits. He's taught almost 100 short courses on quantitative genetics in over two dozen countries on all continents, except for Antarctica, where he is still awaiting an invitation. The one thing I've got on Bruce is I've actually had two invitations to Antarctica and I've been there twice. So there you go. Penguins like you more, what can I say? Yeah, well, the, the penguins weren't actually that happy with me at that moment. But anyway, um, if you don't know, Bruce is a very avid lepidopterist. So don't be surprised if you have a meeting with Bruce and he's carrying a big net over his shoulder. It's got nothing to do with you. And Bruce has successfully described almost 30 new species of moths, which you may hear about some more today. So thanks for joining us, Bruce. Um, please come up to the podium. If you have any questions um, through the presentation, pl please put them in the chat if you're joining us online and we'll do our best to address them in the time we have at the end. So over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, for the people online, we're going to make sure that we answer your questions first. So don't don't be uh, don't be too bashful about that. So what I want to do today is kind of give a kind of historical overview about how we currently view quantitative variation, and just kind of some advice for the young investigators here. If you want to learn a study, I want to learn a field or a topic. What you shouldn't do is find the absolute latest review and read it. That's like having a mystery novel and just reading the last page. You kind of know who did it, but you have no context. The way to really understand the field is to go back to as early as you can in the literature and then to read forward. It's much more satisfying because you'll see how people's ideas developed over time. You'll see the observations that made people change their view because you know our, the scientists that came before us were really, really smart. They just didn't have sort of observations and information we have. So a really good way to learn a field, a topic, is to do that. And I'm going to try to take you through that today to talk about the nature of quantitative variation. So the overview, basically, is I want to start with Darwin and Mendel and take us up to our current view based upon networks. We're going to have a broad sweep here. And so some of the questions that have always been out there in dealing with quantitative variation and with a broad audience, I think it's important to say what I mean by that. Any trait I can assign a number to is a quantitative trait. It could be height, weight. It could be whether a site is methylated or unmethylated. It could be the amount of transcript, either measured indirectly or through RNA-seq. 
any trait I can measure is a quantitative trait. That trait has the potential, if it shows variation, of having some of that variation be due to differences in genetics. Different individuals have different genotypes. Some of that variation may be due to differences in the environment. And so the task of quantitative genetics historically has been to figure out what fraction of variation is from each source. And more recently, the task has been to try to find some of the underlying factors involved in that. So central questions are how much, there's a little hand there, how much of the, the phenotypic variation is due to genetics? How much of that is usable? If that variation can't be passed on from parent to offspring, it's not usable in classic breeding situations, except if you use clones. So there's different types of variation you can pass on. Um, is that variation when it's present due to a few major genes or a lot of small genes? What is the nature of that? Is it typically additive? That is, it passes on, it combines well. Is it dominant or epistatic? That is, you need certain combinations to get the most out of that. Uh, and more importantly, are regulatory or structural differences more important? Is variation we see largely due to differences in amino acid sequences of critical proteins, or is it due to regulation and timing? And finally, how can we exploit that variation? So I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about some of these topics. So we'll start with Darwin. So Darwin, for all his, uh, uh, by the way, I noticed in the botanical gardens that Darwin actually visited Hobart. So there's a connection here. Um, Darwin had a flaw in origins. And the flaw in origins was he assumed blending inheritance. Um, if your father was red and your mother was white, your offspring are pink because you blend the fluids together. And this is kind of the view that a lot of people had about inheritance around the time that Darwin was there. So he essentially assumed what's called blending inheritance. And the problem with that is the first paper in population genetics is actually a book review. Fleming Jenkin, who among other things invented the cable car, very, uh, very diverse individual, uh, a Scottish engineer. And he noticed that if you have blending inheritance, then a very simple argument would be that if the two parents contribute equally, we'll call them X1 and X2, then the variation of that average is half the variation of a single value. Common observation, those of you who've taken a stats class. And what that means is that if with blending inheritance, the variation gets cut in half each generation, and you very, very quickly run out of genetic variation. And so there's, there's kind of this unspoken dilemma that people realized that Darwin's mechanism of natural selection seemed to be reasonable, but the heritable part was really not quite well worked out. The answer was published about the same time that Darwin was, that was Mendel. Mendel had genes as discrete particles. He typically assumed that a single gene controlled the single trait. And he also had this notion of hidden variation. If you, for example, you had a, a, a yellow pea, that yellow pea could have a yellow and a green particle because the green particle was recessive. Mendel's work went, went basically ignored for 40 years for a variety of reasons, whereas Darwin's work was immediately important. The key is Mendel's segregation of these genes as discrete particles completely solved Darwin's problem of blending inheritance. We're going to come back to the connection because it turns out that these views of biology, Darwin and Mendel, which we now view as being complementary and jointed, actually were the cause of a lot of controversy early on. And a lot of that controversy kind of still reigns today in different, different phases. So Mendel's work wouldn't be acknowledged for 40 years. And so the focus then remained largely on the work of Darwin and statistical ways to describe data. So one of the first people to, to look at this was Francis Galton, among other things, uh, invented the mountain tent for those of you to go camping. And what, Dal what, what Galton basically did was he looked at the association between parents and their offspring. Kind of what we do today, but with a different focus. And he noticed this following pattern, I'll show it here. So what we have here is down on the X axis, we have the average height of parents being you know, one of those colonialists, I have it in inches over here, instead of this meters or centimeters. And what he noticed was the dotted, the, the uh, circles here were the values. So for example, this is an average value of the two parents, average value of the offspring. When you fit a regression through that, a line through that, what you notice is that line has a slope less than one. So the term regression 
actually comes from this observation, the regression towards mediocrity. These exceptional parents up here, their offspring, if they're on the dotted line, would be the same value, but their offspring are less exceptional. And so henceforth, they were media, uh, less, less, less exceptional regression towards mediocrity. In true Victorian fashion, Galton looked at this and said, England is doomed. And the reason he said this was, he said, well, you have all these really smart aristocrats up here and up here and their kids are dumber than they are. Now, what he neglected was you have all these dumb aristocrats down here whose kids are smarter than they are. So the net result is <clears throat> you don't get a net change. But this notion of looking at statistical relationships was really motivated by Darwin because the idea with Darwin was small effects have long-term evolutionary consequences. And so 1900, Mendel is rediscovered. When Mendel's rediscovered, you had two camps. You had this long-term camp called the biometricians, followers of Darwin, trying to describe inheritance in statistical terms, trying to quantify small differences because they thought those might be important for selection. Then you had the Mendelians, those that had rediscovered Mendel and viewed uh, evolution slightly differently. And so you had this, this pretty enormous controversy for about 10 years. So Weldon and Pearson were two of the people in here. And as a consequence of trying to quantify variation, things such as regressions and correlations arose. So a lot of modern statistics traces back to genetics and trying to basically resolve this issue. So when Mendel was rediscovered in 1900, you had these two camps. The long-term st statisticians, the biometricians, were looking at small changes in variation. The Mendelians, from Mendel's work, you either had a short P or a tall P. That little variation around short P's, that little variation around tall P's didn't really matter. So they assumed that the biometricians were looking at noise that had no bearing whatsoever and that all of evolution happened by major general jumps called saltational evolution. So you had this diverging opinion when in fact both sides had part of the answer to them. Now, their idea um, that evolution was mainly driven by waiting for larger mutations was not actually without data. And some of the early data they looked at was Johansson, um, and I think he was looking at peas, and what he would, beans, I'm sorry, he was looking at pure lines. And so when Johansson did parent offspring regression, let's look at this line in the middle here with the open squares. If you look acro across here, for example, it says if, uh, if uh, parents had an average seed weight of uh, 0.2 grams, their offspring had an average, sorry, 0.4 uh, grams, their offspring had an average seed weight of about 0.45 grams. What you'll notice here is that each line, each of these uh, connected points represents a different strain of beans. And so you'll notice is there's obviously a difference between the different strains of beans, the different pure uh, lines of beans, but within any given line, it doesn't matter how large or how small the parents were, the offspring were about the same. And this is quite different from the view that Galton saw. Now we know the explanation for this is very straightforward. These are inbred lines, so there's no variation, whereas Galton was looking at an outbred population. But nonetheless, it was observations like this that suggested to the Mendelians that none of that variation that you saw really was any relevant. It was just kind of noise. We would frame it as being all environmental and that for evolution to occur, you had to have these major jumps due to mutation. So that view got modified a little bit when Nelson Ella was looking at seed color in wheat. And he was able to very elegantly show that if you crossed a very pale wheat and a very red wheat, that you basically got color forms that were consistent with multiple loci contributing to color. And this was a major departure from Mendel, who had one gene, one trait. This was the first notion of having Mendelian view, where you had multiple loci impacting one trait. So we have kind of all the pieces in place at the end of, let's say, 1910. And it was put together by Fisher. So R.A. Fisher in 1918 wrote his famous paper here. Don't read this paper, it's not readable. Um, in this paper, Fisher not only fused quantitative traits with Mendelian genetics, 
the term variance is used for the first time. Before that, people use standard error. The analysis of variance was developed to do this machinery. So this is a landmark paper in both genetics and statistics. What happens with any landmark paper? It was rejected. So in 1916, he submitted it to the Royal Society of London. It was too genetical for the biometricians and too statistical for the Mendelians. So it was kind of just right. And it was rejected. Um, it was later published in 1918 in the Backwater Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, and mainly it was published because uh, one of Darwin's sons was pretty active in getting it done. So this is the paper that literally founded quantitative genetics. What Fisher assumed was that if you take a typical trait, let's say height, that height was determined by a large number of genes, each of which has fairly small effects. This is his infinitesimal model. In the limit, you have an infinite number of genes, each of which does nothing. If you take that limit right, you can get something. So of course the idea was that's an abstraction. The idea is you've got a fairly large number of genes, each of which has a small effect. And several people throughout this uh, workshop have talked about the infinitesimal model, sometimes religiously, sometimes rather snidely. We'll see at the end of the talk that Fisher had parts of it right, but parts of it wrong. So this was the basis for quantitative genetics for, for many generations to come. So the foundation has been set. 1920 rolls around just before the Great Depression. You basically had people understanding that you could look at these continuous traits in a Mendelian genetics framework, but you simply had a large number of genes, each of whose effects are fairly small. From 1930 to 1980, you basically saw genetics split off into two major camps. You had major developments in statistical methods for quantitative traits. The Breeders' Equation came about that people keep on mentioning. That was Jay Lush in 1937 in a famous book called Animal Breeding Plans. You had a, a lot of statistical design. Fisher was working on the theory of, of experimental design that got transformed into estimating variances. Bluff was developed, mixed models were developed. You had a lot of work going on in statistics. At the same time, you also, starting about 1950, had the foundation of modern molecular genetics with Avery McLeod and McCarthy in 44, showing that DNA was important. Hershey Chase in 53, showing that DNA was indeed not the material, not protein. Then you had, you know, the lac operon. So from about the 50s on, you start this divergence between quantitative genetics, which was entirely statistical, and molecular evolution, molecular genetics, I should say, they started picking apart the genes. So you had this split, but it wasn't the same acrimony that the biometricians and the Mendelians had. It was more kind of one of indifference because people felt that, you know, the, the molecular people felt that quantitative genetics was a bit of an anachronism and became more of an anachronism over time as people found out more and more about gene structure. When people didn't know what genes were, having a nebulous statistical concept wasn't that difficult. It was kind of like quantum mechanics where people thought about atoms. But once you understood what genes were, this idea of a statistical notion became less and less desirable. And so you had a natural diversion of molecular genetics from quantitative genetics. That changed a little bit in the 80s. What happened in the 80s was people could now slowly start getting a relatively modest number of markers. So before the 80s, if I'm gonna use markers, let's say in Drosophila, I'd have weird markers like Antennapedia where an antenna grows out of the eye or it'd have some weird wing character. So I'd have morphological markers. Maybe I'd have five or six, putting them in a strain would be very difficult. So we really didn't have markers to analyze uh, crosses. In the 60s, we got what are called allozymes, electrophoretic markers a couple of dozen of those. In the 80s, we start, first started getting uh, RFLPs and started getting some of the DNA markers coming around. And that led to the development of what's called quantitative trait loci or QTL mapping. Now, the idea wasn't new. Payne in 1917 did this by looking at whole chromosome segments. And a classic paper, Sachs in 1923 did this, which Sachs noticed when he crossed a heavy spotted bean line with a less heavy unspotted bean. When he looked at the F2, he found both spotted and unspotted heavy and unheavy beans. 
and he saw that generally speaking, spotted beans tend to be heavier, but the association wasn't perfect. He saw heavy beans that weren't spotted and spotted beans that weren't heavy. And he naturally assumed that the gene for spotting and a, g a major gene involving weight were linked. That is, it wasn't pliotrope, it wasn't the same gene, but they were linked. And this was the idea behind QTL mapping. So he could do it in the 20s, we simply didn't have the marker. As allozymes became available and RFLPs, we could do that. And here's the, just people haven't seen it, here's the basic idea. It's this idea from linkage. If I have a double heterozygote, so a way to get that is if I cross two inbred lines, so big M and little m are a marker, big Q and little q are different alleles at an unscored locus that impacts the trait. In the F1, I get a big M, big Q gamete and a little m, little q gamete. Then in the F2, I get four gametes. Under Mendel, you'd have independent assortment and these were all equally frequent at a quarter. If you have linkage, then two of those are more common. Those correspond to the two phases of the parents and two of those are rarer. And in the extreme, for example, if I have a recombination frequency of 2%, then basically every time I have a big M, I have a big Q. Every time I have a little M, I have a little Q. So QTL mapping uses this in a very obvious fashion. I take everyone here, I look at marker one, I then break people into those individuals which are homozygote, heterozygote, and alternate homozygote. I've got three groups. I do an ANOVA, I look for differences between the groups. I see no effects, I move on to the next marker. I keep on doing this. Finally, one marker I get to, I do see an effect. And I see an effect because that marker is co-segregating with a gene that has a big enough impact that I can pick it up given my sample size. This was the idea of QTL mapping. It came up in the 80s, it was very popular, um, and it, it produced a large number of papers. Here's one of the early papers. This is Edwards' work, Edwards and Stuber out of North Carolina, and they were looking at uh, a number of traits in maize. And what you can see here, down here on the bottom is R squared is simply the fraction of the phenotypic variation accounted for by a QTL. So for example, here's a big QTL. It accounts for 8% of all the variation. This is the number that accounts for 1%. And obviously in this range near zero here, you run into statistical power issues. So you get kind of an L-shaped curve here. And what this suggests is that you're kind of seeing a little bit of fissure and you're seeing a lot of genes of small effect, but you're not seeing infinitesimal and you see some genes of larger effect here. People also found genes of major effect. This is a classic study um, by Bradshaw and Shemsky where they were crossing a, uh, uh, a bumblebee pollinated monkey flower, Memulus, in the Scrophariaceae, with a hummingbird uh, pollinated. And there were differences in flower color and coronal size. And when they mapped those, what they saw is they saw QTLs of big effect. For example, the carotenoid QTL accounted for 80%. You had three corona with QTLs, which accounted for, you know, 60. They don't have to one because of, of, of rounding errors. Don't worry about that. So what you saw was that there were some QTLs that had fairly large effects. And the idea now that we now move from a stage of kind of a statistical average accounting for something to now having a discrete region. Now that discrete region wasn't a nucleotide. It was usually a segment of a pretty big segment of, you know, on the order of about uh, 20 centimorgans. So roughly speaking about 20 megabases, a lot of genes in there. So the analogy was, it would be like going from saying the globe is the genome. There's a gene somewhere on the globe that's saying, hey, the gene is in Tasmania. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than saying it's somewhere in the globe. So QTL mapping got people really excited. The 1990s was kind of the culmination I'm gonna call this the age of semi-major genes. People took this logical technology, you get markers, you cross typically two inbred lines or two widely divergent lines. You then look at the offspring, F2 or back cross, or you can go advanced intercross. And what they found was genes of major effect were common. They weren't, you know, they didn't, they weren't always seen, but they were they're certainly not uncommon. And many of the differences between lines that were fixed could be accounted for by what appear to be a few uh, apparent major genes. You also have a lot of genes of a small effect. And so breeders thought, hey, this is it, this is great. We can take these markers from QTLs. We can then select four plants with those marker alleles 
and therefore speed up our breeding programs and get pretty high efficiency. And in some cases it worked out. This is called Marcus's selection. In most cases it didn't. And I'm sure Mark will uh, uh, back me up on this, but apparently a lot of breeding companies basically went under using this technology. So, uh, you know, breeding companies are very pragmatic. Uh, they want it to work. They had an invested interest, but it didn't work. So why didn't it? You had obvious signals of genes of major effect, but for the most part, there were, there were noticeable success stories, but for the most part, it wasn't working. And it turns out there were a couple of reasons. QTL is a misleading term because L for loci doesn't mean a single point. It means a chunk of chromosome. And so when people started trying to find map these, so if I have a block, I can then make additional crosses with denser markers in that block and break that block from a 20 centimorgan block into a 10 centimorgan block into a five centimorgan block. So when people went in and they saw a big statistical peak in the middle of one of these blocks and went in and find mapped it, they saw they then got two smaller significant peaks. Well, no big deal, one to two. Then they took one of those smaller peaks, they looked at it, it got two smaller peaks. So as they mapped it finer and finer and finer, these things fractioning, they kind of went away. Why? Well, that initial big giant block that we called the QTL had a number of effects all tightly associated. We called it in linkage disequilibrium. And so it appeared like a super gene. There was a big signal. As that signal decayed away, so for example, you had a whole bunch of little tiny alleles with plus effects on them. As you broke it up, you got smaller and smaller chunks and the effects became smaller and smaller. So they fractionate. The other issue is something called the Beavis effect or the winner's curse. And I'll talk about this a bit because it's actually fairly important. When you declare a QTL as being significant, that process of only focusing on significant QTLs overestimates their effect. And here's why, it's actually pretty easy to explain. So what I've drawn here, this uh, dark curve here is, so the, the red line here is the true value. So I've got a marker, it's got an association, and I do an experiment and I get an effect. And in theory, I can do this experiment several thousand times and get a histogram. And this would be the histogram of that effect, this, this dark curve here I've written by a, a normal. If I have high statistical power to detect that effect, that means its signal is much bigger than the noise, then basically every realization above this dotted line here, I take as significant. And so I only truncate off a little bit of the tail here. So the value of the curve that's left that is everything to the right of that truncation point, there's its estimated value in the blue, it's right next to its expected value in the red. Now, where it really shows up is here. Suppose I have very low power. It means that my signal is very weak relative to my noise. Only a tiny amount of the time will the realization be big enough for me to declare to be significant given the noise in my signal. And so if I just take the mean of those realizations up there, that's much larger than the true mean. And this is the Beavis effect. It's also called the winner's curse in epidemiology. When you condition on a marker being significant, you overestimate its effect. And the overestimation is really severe when the power is low. And you don't know when the power is low because you can't take the estimated effect to estimate your power because it's biased. And to show that this really isn't trivial, Bill Beavis's original simulations assumed a whole bunch of QTLs each of which accounted for less than 2%. Here's a histogram of the effects accounted for by his significant QTL. So for example, a lot of them assume that you had a 20% effect, a tenfold overestimation. So a lot of these early QTLs, which looked like major genes, number one were synthetic associations because of linkage, not broken up. And number two were often overestimated. So the surprising thing is that any of these marker assisted selection experiments actually worked. So it was a quandary. And how do you solve quandary? New technology. So 1990s, we had, you know, you could go out and legitimately get a couple of hundred markers and feel comfortable. Very often RFLPs or SSRs, maybe with some allozymes in there. Then we had the genomics revolution. And right around 2000-ish, markers started becoming really common. I mean, really, really common. So getting and scoring 10,000 
100,000, 500,000 markers now became feasible. And that led to the next round of mapping called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. In a QTL study, what I do is I make a cross. That cross is typically pretty small, a couple of hundred, and I'm looking at linkage. So I've got big associations in there. In a GWAS, I can take a population sample. So I can sample 3,000, 7,000, 100,000. So I've got a much larger sample, and I also have much closer linked uh, markers. So I can look at that. So the typical level of resolution depends upon if I sample from a population, how close related do random alleles tend to be associated? And that closeness is on the order of usually about 10 KB or so. So I go from a mapping resolution in the megabases to a mapping resolution in the kilobase space. So GWAS became extremely popular and allowed for really, really fine mapping. And basically the idea is that Suppose I have a gene that arises on this red chromosome. It's a new mutation. So if you get that new mutation, you're bigger. That new mutation is going to be associated with markers nearby it until they get randomized by recombination. If those markers are really, really close, that could take hundreds of generations. And that generates this association signal that GWAS use. And here's what a typical GWAS looks like. This is looking at a single gene. Each, each pixel here is testing a specific SNP and exactly tested the same way you do a QTL. I have a SNP, I've got homozygote one, heterozygote, homozygote two. I take my data, I break it into homozygote one, heterozygote, homozygote two, measure the trait value, ask if there's a between SNP difference, turn into a p-value and plot. What you see here is there's a really strong signal in the middle of this gene. Look at the resolution here, right? The resolution here is on the kilobase scale. And then it allows me to say that somewhere around that marker, again, we're not scoring are the markers, but somewhere around that marker is the actual causative site. So much, much higher resolution. Now, GWASs are really nice, but what GWAS measures isn't a difference in mean, they measure a variance because I'm sampling a population. So if the homozygotes are really rare in one case, that affects it. In a line cross, Homozygotes are quarter, quarter, heterozygotes are half, guaranteed. In an outbred population, it depends upon the allele frequencies. So what you're actually scoring then is the variation accounted for by a marker. And that variation could be small because the marker effect is small. That is, A is small, the marker effect, the, the true effect. Or it could be because the marker effect A is big, but the allele is really rare. And so this led to the question, was the bulk of genetic variation due to common alleles, that is P bigger than 5%, the frequency of small effect or large alleles of really, uh, really rare effects? So the take home message from GWAS studies of quantitative variation right around 2015 or so was there were many sites, each of small effect. And the effect here is the variance. So it's not Fisher's infinitesimal, it's the fact that each particular type site had a small amount of variance associated with it. That could mean I had a small effect allele that was common, or it could mean I had a massive effect allele that was extremely rare. Human height is an example. There are alleles that give you extremely tall individuals or extremely short individuals, gigantism or dwarfism, but they're incredibly rare. So the amount of variance they account for is really tiny, even though their effects are huge because they're so rare. So we noticed right away that there were a lot of sites. Talk about how many, many in a second. We noticed that each site typically had a small variance. We also noticed where we could measure it, there was this inverse relationship where when you could actually estimate the allelic effect, the effect tended to be uh, larger as allele frequencies got smaller. There's this inverse relationship. But the part that really got people scratching their head was 80% of the hits were in non-coding regions and in non-coding regions by a fair amount. So these weren't rare amino acids changes we we're picking up. These were changes outside of coding regions. So people started scratching their head about that. The other problem they had was something called the missing heritability problem, right? The picture here. Now, there was a very famous uh, Nature article and it showed a picture in the background of a thief going out the window with the missing heritability. 
and it sparked a problem. The missing heritability problem is simply this. You're a well-funded, very well-funded uh, molecular lab. You've spent $20 million finding uh, uh, GWAS hits for type two diabetes. We know from twin studies how much of the, uh, what heritability should be, that is how much of added variation you see in, in type two diabetes. When you take all your significant markers, you account for about 10% of the data. So as a ecologist kind of snidely pointed out, the fruits of the, gen the genomic revolution were beat by an order of magnitude by a method from the Victorian era of regression. So this caused a huge controversy, the missing heritability, where was it? We found markers, lots of markers, but the numbers didn't match up. One explanation for that is look, look at this example here, I'll go through this very quickly because you can get the main line. So big M and little m are the marker and suppose that big Q is a mutation that arose on the M chromosome background. So whenever you see a big Q, you see a big M, but a lot of big M chromosomes don't have big Q. So if R is the fraction of big M that contain big Q, then the amount of variance of the causal variation that's accounted for by the marker is only R. So for example, if only 10% of the big M chromosomes carry big Q, then if you use M, the variance it accounts for is only 10% of the actual variance. So the marker variance is only gonna account for a fraction of the causal variance. So as labs got more and more funds, they started looking at got, getting more and more individuals. So human height is one of the classic ones studied and Peter Vischer at UQ uh, in, in Brisbane is one of the labs that have done a lot of work on here. Human height, the heritability is about 70 to 80%. 70 to 80% of all the phenotypic variation is due to the effects of individual genes taken one at a time. Interactions don't matter too much. So in 2008, they looked at 40,000 individuals. They found 27 GWAS hits, and they could account for 6% of the variation, one-tenth of that. 2010, they stepped their game up and moved from 40,000 to 180,000. They got 200 hits. They could account for 14%. 2014, they got it up to a quarter of a million, kind of funds you wish you had. They got 700 hits, 700 sites that accounted for 20%. So around 30% of the variation they could account for. If they then used the best, these were significant. If you then used the, the, uh, the uh, top uh, 2,000, 3,700, and 9,500, you could account for 26, 30, and 36%. In 2018, 700,000, 3,000 hits, they could account for 35%. So that missing heritability has two sources. Number one, this is the, a, a, one of those plots over all the chromosomes. Everything above this blue line is significant and included the marker. Those that are included up here still only account for a fraction because you don't have complete association. But number two, you've got a lot of markers down here, which are biologically significant, but don't reach this threshold you need when accounting for multiple tests. So the missing heritability problem caused a lot of consternation, but on reflection, what it really meant was there was a lot more sites of small effect than people thought. And you need to think about your design differently to pick up that power. So if you put all the markers in, so you made a statistical method throwing all these markers in with a random model, in 2010, with 4,000 individuals, you could account for 62% of the heritability. In 2015, with 44,000 individuals, you could account for 80%. But you can take this further and get some really shocking conclusions about this. So humans have about, roughly speaking, about 20,000 genes. If you look at schizophrenia, another thing they looked at, 70% of all regions one megabase or larger have a risk site. That's 3,000 regions in the human genome, right away for schizophrenia. In 2022, right now, uh, they, they looked at about 26,000 individuals with whole genome sequences. And what they basically found was you could account for most of the heritability. The bottom line is that when you extrapolate those out, the number of sites that are involved 
in humans for variation in height is on the order of 100,000. Five times as many as the number of genes. Now, precise are individual SNPs. But remember, most of these are in non-coding regions. So the current dilemma we have is how do you account for these observations of small effects with some large effects, but really rare, hundreds of thousands of sites, many more sites than genes, and most sites being in non-coding regions. The answer is you can also do a Q-tail mapping, but instead of on a trait, you can look at regulatory features. You can look at levels of messenger RNA expression. That's called an EQTL. You can look at chromosome sites, histone modification, acetylation sites. And you find a large number of these QTLs, which is just kind of a different uh, list of things people looked at, that do regulation. And when you map regulation of a specific site, for example, this site has a DNA1 sensitive region, I can map it as a trait. It either does or doesn't. I can then ask, is there genetic variation? Well, there's some variation at the site, but there's also variation on different chromosomes that impact that. So I can actually map that. And when you map that, you then end up getting uh, a, a, a kind of a picture about how, how to put these things together. So the observations are, traits are massively polygenic, 10,000 or more sites. The per site variation is typically small, but the effects can be rather large. They just, when they're large, they tend to be rare. So you have a large range of effect size, but a small typical variance. And most of them are non-coding regions. So one way to put this together, and Daniel actually mentioned this kind of independently, is something that Pritchard recently called the omnigenic model, um, all genes. And the idea basically is this, you have a series of core genes and a series of shell genes around them. So let's, a couple of quick things to finish off first. <clears throat> Biological networks. We talked a little bit about graph theory. You're excited about networks here. So if I have a node and inputs coming in edges, a random graph, if I look at how many uh, uh, edges are attached to a particular node, that follows a Poisson distribution. It has a peak and then it falls off exponentially. A type of graph called the scale-free graph, that degree distribution, how many connections falls off at a power law. And what that means is you have a couple of, of, of uh, nodes here at the end that have a huge number of connections. Those are called hubs. And biological graphs, generally speaking, tend to be scale-free. That is, they have a few sites that have far many more connections than you expect from a random graph. Random graphs have something called the small world feature. You can move from one node to any other node in a small number of steps. It's the classic Kevin Bacon problem that any actor you know can be traced back to a few actors that appear in a movie with Kevin Bacon. It's the six degree of separation notice. That's a small world feature. Random graphs have that. Erdos Remy random graphs have that. Um, Scale-free graphs are ultra small. They actually have it quicker than that. So what do we see? Well, protein-protein interaction networks and metabolic networks tend to be scale-free but an interesting thing is in gene regulatory networks, where you have things coming in and things going out, what you see is the incoming distribution. Those sites that tend to affect a particular node, those then tend to basically uh, follow a random graph. That is, they have an exponential uh, degree. You've got very few inputs coming in, but the output is scale-free. So if you take a typical gene, most of them have very few coming out, but some of them have a very large number coming in. So the omnigenic idea puts these idea about scale-free graphs together and suggests kind of the following picture. You've got peripheral genes, and those genes have some elaborate network. And again, that elaborate network could be that this gene up here controls a transacting factor that influences a DNA one sensitive site here, which has a cis interaction on a transcript over here, which then influences something, which then influences these things in trans. So you've got this complicated regulatory network over here, where any effect you have is going to percolate through and end up in a tiny effect here on regulating a couple of what are often called core genes. A couple could be a couple hundred. And those genes are the ones that produce the transcripts that actually influence our trait. So the idea for the omnigenic model, and people 
argue about this notion of core genes. But the idea is mutations in these genes up here can have dramatic effects. Those tend to be the large effect genes, which are really rare. The small effect genes, which are really common and really numerous, are in here. And what models like this suggest is that basically, if I have a tissue that impacts my trait, any gene that's on in that trait, that's regulated in that trait, may have an indirect effect on the core genes that are on in that tissue that impact our focal trait. So this points out the connection between networks and also points out some of the difficulties you're gonna run into. If your idea is to find usable variation for improving crops, some of that may be little effects over this wide network. If your idea is to find key genes and pathways, those might be these genes here, where natural populations are affected to be large, but they'd be extremely rare. So the idea is Fisher's original notion is actually not that far off in that we've got an enormous number of sites that basically influence traits. Most of those sites influence traits via regulation. That regulation could go through multiple steps before impacting it. So in that result, their effects are small. So the current view, starting from Gar moving up today, we have on quantitative variation is number one, most traits show significant added variation. What that means is that if you look at alleles one at a time and simply consider their effects, you get a big impact. Parents can pass those on to offspring. Um, most genes have a small effect in that the variance they account for is small, but that could be because they have uh, occasionally have a rare allele of really big effect or because they have lots of alleles of small effect. Core alleles should have rare alleles of big effect. Proliferal alleles should have small alleles of, of common effect. Regulatory regions are at least as important as structural regions. And so you have this dilemma about what type of variation you want to exploit. If you're interested in biological pathways and dissecting them, you probably want to look at major genes, that is large effect genes, which are rare, if you're interested in exploiting material for breeding, you probably want to look at uh, looking at scoring those really common genes of really small effect and things like genomic selection can basically get a handle on that. So that kind of is the overview I wanted to give you. And I wanted to highlight some of the things that, I've, that have been discussed here and how some of the connections come in. Our current view of quantitative genetics is this elaborate interplace where basically every site can potentially be a QTL and what that means is sites are incredibly pleiotropic. One site can influence a large number of genes. You go back to the network up here, any of these sites in here can influence potentially <clears throat> a large number of different traits, but their influences are really, really tiny, so they're hard to pick up. So that's our current view of quantitative variation. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. And I think I'll start first with uh, any questions there might be from the chat. I'm actually on time. Convert this to be video only now. Can't be free for TV. No, I think we're done. Any questions from the chat there? I see a number one down there. That's me. <laughs> so, so if you have any questions, please put them here. Well, we're waiting for that. We'll keep an eye on those. I'll open up to general questions. I actually finished early, so without any clock, that's pretty good. <laughs> questions, comments, uh, disagreements are especially welcome. Thanks for a wonderful talk. That was just fantastic. Um, do you have a view on how sort of phylogenetic methods or phylo GWAS could contribute? Do you think that has a some chance of finding these core genes rather than the yeah. peripheral ones? So I have a bias here because Jill Felsenstein was my major professor. So I oh, tend excellent. to think about phylogenetic methods a bit <laughs> as long as they're not parsimony, but that's a separate issue. Yeah, no, only um, maximum likelihood or Bayesian in this room. There we sure. go. We're, we're all we're all good company then. Um, so I, I think they can, now part of the issue, and so for example, people like Peter Vischer and Naomi Ray up at UQ have argued, I think quite correctly, that this, the, the issue with the omnigenic model isn't all the regulatory things with small effect, it's the core genes. How do you find them? Yeah. How do you find them and, and are they actually there? Yeah. So, um, because it may be that you can affect a trait without a transcript, right? So for example, it could be cell-cell interaction, and the cell-cell interaction might occur because of where the chromosome binds on the nuclear membrane may influence the cell in such a way that it impacts it, or it may influence the, you know, the receptors on the cell. 
So I think that there are ways to try to find these core genes. The issue becomes, is there merit in that? Because you might work really, really hard to find a core gene that has a really small effect relative to all the other genes you know about, when in fact the net sum of all the regulatory changes are much, much larger. So the idea about basically looking for, looking for conservation of, of sites or regulatory patterns over phylogenies is certainly a useful concept. That's, that's proved well for mammalian genetics. Yeah. Thanks very much. Cheers, okay. Could you please provide your idea on uh, PRS, I believe is polygenic risk scores for clinical use in humans. We'll come back to Sean in a second. So the idea is um, the way people do genomic selection and the way people do polygenic risk scores is very similar. You score a large number of markers. With each marker, you assign an effect. Then I can go into you and I can look at your marker score take it with that cheat sheet effect score and then give you a score, take a you know, weighted average, your effect, your, your the frequency of your marker, you know, homozygote, heterozygote, zero, one or two basically times a risk for that. And I can get a polygenic risk score for you or PRS. Same thing is kind of used with genomic selection. Those haven't worked out well in the sense the predictability is pretty small for a variety of reasons. It's not zero. And if you go on and take something like 23andMe, you can get a risk score. You know, those have done it and gotten their risk scores and gotten really worried. You have a 700 risk score. Those right now, I think you're, I, I think it's a, a really interesting idea, but it's a little bit fuzzy. It's worked a lot better in genomic selection. The reason it's worked in genomic selection isn't because the accuracy is high, but because we can crank over selection really, really quickly. Instead of waiting 20 years for a pine tree, we can throw a seed out right away based upon a risk score factor. So it's really worked well in breeding, but for a different reason. So for that reason, I think that polygenic risk scores for clinical use in humans are an intriguing idea that's not quite there yet. It may never get there, unfortunately. And it may never get there because we simply don't have the power to estimate all these tiny effect scores. Something for the homogenic model underestimates the complexity of traits. I don't disagree with that. When I showed that homogenic model, Notice I had this elaborate network structure. Then I had these simple core genes. Those core genes have a network as well, right? So I think the core gene view, it, like all science is an incomplete picture of reality, but it captures its essence. You've got a couple of genes that are probably closer to the trait itself. Maybe the kernel genes as Daniel likes to say, and those genes may have a more direct input and those genes are subtly influenced by basically all the other regulation that happens in the cell. So I don't disagree the omnigenic model may be overly simplistic, which is funny when you look at how complicated it actually is. Audience questions then? Keep an eye on here. Thanks for that question, Sean. People want their coffee badly. No, no one's got their hands up. You know, we're... They're thinking about how they redo their videos. So with regard to the, the sort of pan genome projects that the center is doing, would, would you do you think it would be sensible to assume that core genes would be in the core genome and that the, 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 the other stuff would be? That's a great question. And so one of the things people have noticed is if you have a, a scale, a small world or ultra small scale free network, it's really robust because there's a couple of hubs you knock out, you're screwed but they're a tiny, tiny fraction. So if you look at the gene knockout data from Arabidopsis or yeast, it's almost always the case you can knock out any gene and not see any obvious phenotypic effect. Now the ecologists and evolutionists will say, it's not obvious, but it's got a fitness advantage and therefore it's important. But it does mean that biological pathways are really robust. You can work around genes that are missing. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that if you just focus on pan genes, you might miss, it might be that, uh, that there is a set of genes that you can switch in and out as cassettes arbitrarily. And if you if you look at the pan gene, you'll miss those. Yeah. So it might be genes one, three, or four all work in this slot and they kind of go back yeah. and forth. Yeah. So you could lose any one of them, but as soon as you lose all four, maybe. Yeah. And so the, so remember, biological systems have this weird uh problem they have to solve. They have to be very robust to any environmental perturbation but not so robust they don't respond to environmental perturbations, mm. right? And that's a fine line to, to ship. Ah, Scott, well, thank you, Scott. Your check is in the mail. Um, uh, our ability to understand genetic trait limited by precision. Ah, yes, 
So get your first point, key point. So how many of you are genome focused? Go ahead and raise your hands. Proudly, there you go. So yeah, look at Peter with a big smile. These methods work really well if you have accurate measurements of your phenotype. Genomics, we know accuracy. We can have all sorts of internal estimates for accuracy. If you get bad trait data, you can't tell that. If you get bad genome data, you can tell that. You've got quality control built in. If you get a bad gene, if you get bad phenotyping, you can't tell that. Phenotyping is critically important. It's often taken kind of as an afterthought. No, no, no. Phenotyping is more important than genotyping because you can always correct for bad genotyping. You can't correct for bad phenotyping. So phenotyping is absolutely critical. So um, uh, it's limited by ability to define phenotyping. Plants have an advantage. You can do replicate designs and improve things. What advances would come via step changes in phenotyping? So um, let me paraphrase the second question. I think the way to understand variation is to not think about a single trait, but think about a multivariate trait space. Because in evolution, selection is acting on this thing called fitness. Fitness is determined by traits. But what we think of the traits are not necessarily what Mother Nature is looking at in traits. So we have this complicated multidimensional structure that we abstract traits from and try to predict how well those describe fitness. So I think the, the emerging view in quantitative genetics is highly multivariate. We have to look at pathways. Those you can write as matrices or over time stacks of matrices or tensors. The, the way we look at traits is not looking at single traits, looking at large combinations of traits and maybe pulling out things like principal components from that. So Bruce, maybe I'll take the advantage being in charge of this microphone to ask the last question. And I know you've got lots of opinions on this and it is important to this audience, but you didn't really talk much about genotype by environment interaction and with plants, an environment is a critical thing. They can't run away from it um, within their life cycle. Um, some of them are long lived in the environment they've been dealt with. And that can be a really influential factor on a lot of the ability to get at the underlying architecture of these traits as we've been discussing here. Yeah, I, I know you've got lots of opinions. I, well, I have so. lots of opinions, a lot of stuff, but, but yep. including that t-shirt, by the way. Um, but uh, that's that's not negative. Don't don't be so critical. Actually, I may actually kind of like- They assumed. Um, so uh, the, the, the way to think about, about G by E is that pathway is not a fixed object. If you think about a movie and each frame you go to a different environment, that pathway is changing. It's flashing the connect. Those network connections are getting stronger or weaker. They're breaking, they're reforming. So I think one of the interesting things to look at over G by E is stability of pathways. Because I think one way to get at core genes might be to, to look as you cross environments, what genes kind of stay in that pathway. Now, the flip side is we often treat the same gene in multiple environments as a set of correlated characters, which brings back the correlated character problem. But I think G by E is critical. And I think looking at how pathways change over environments, even if it's just, you know, wet dry, I think will give lots of insight as to how, how they're rewired by evolution on, or how they're rewired by regulation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've reached the end of our time allocation. And so it, it sort of gives me the, um, Great pleasure to thank you, Bruce, for a very stimulating talk. I, I think we're already seeing some positive feedback and um, really great. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with your opinion about my T-shirt. Your T-shirt also has some question marks associated with it as well. But anyway, we'll discuss that afterwards. Um, and, and thank you for everybody online who are joining us today that probably didn't get as much opportunity to check out either of our t-shirts anyway so but yeah it, we will we may post them at some point <laughs> but there will be i can guarantee you um a recording of this uh, presentation so i'd encourage you to check out the plant success youtube channel if you wish to watch it again and I, there's a lot of little gems in there that i think are really good entry points into reading um bruce's um, two volumes and um, I would encourage you to actually look at each of these chapters as a mine of great 
um, information for all of us here. And each chapter basically is a literature review that sort of makes probably the maths a little bit friendlier than if you go to the primary literature. Having been someone who had no choice but to read Fisher's original paper as sort of prescribed material that they had to understand prior to the availability of Bruce's books. But anyway, thank you very much. Very stimulating. And I'm sure you'll get a lot of interaction with everybody and, and questions since. So thank you for joining us. And I'll close the meeting there.